Five steps to using your Google Search Console data to get more traffic with Marco Giordano. The In Search SEO podcast is brought to you by Rank Ranger, the all in one SEO platform that helps skill your business through data and analytics. Hey, it's David. Are you actively using Google Search Console data to get more traffic? That's what we're going to be discussing today with a man who, when he's not busy running calculations or preparing SEO strategies, he fights the darkness of SEO misinformation on Twitter and LinkedIn. He's an SEO specialist and data analyst focused on B2C content websites and publishers. A warm welcome to the InSearch SEO podcast, Marco Giordano. Thanks, David. So, if we have to start, um, the first and most important thing is, of course, having the setup. So the first step is having the correct, uh, you know, setup and requirements for your project. Those are essentially your API access. So when you're working with Google data, it's always better to use the APIs rather than the exports you get from the interfaces for a simple question of how, ma uh, how much data you get. Because otherwise you get less and it's also harder to work with manual processes. So ideally, if you have a development team, or if you can do it yourself, you can just use this uh, Search Console API, which is free, so you don't pay it, and you know, set up some scripts or some code that can make calls to this API to retrieve, to pull this data, okay? So this is the most important step, because otherwise you have nothing to work with, and there are other factors to consider, like what you have to pull and how. A recommendation for big websites or for agencies is to create a cloud function in a cloud platform. So essentially a function, something that runs on cloud uh, within Google servers so that you're able to send this data to BigQuery. So let's say to a sort of database storage where you keep this data safe, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the most important step. You have to define, of course, what you have to pull. Like, do you want only the US? Do I want all the countries? Do I want only mobile? So it depends on your project. So that was step number one of five steps using your Google Search Console data to get more traffic. Bringing us to step two, as you just said, they're defining goals. Yeah, defining goals. So, I mean, you have to understand what to do with data like why you need this data. I just put it as number two, as not as number one, because you always need to work with Search Console if you're doing SEO. I mean, because it's organic data, so I guess you need to use them anyway. Defining goals, I mean, means understanding what you want to do for with the next steps, so in terms of analysis, like why and what you want to analyze something, because mm, otherwise you're just running in circles. And an example is that if you're analyzing a B2C content website, almost always you just want to check, you know, like how to increase traffic, how to find uh, good opportunities, like in terms of content production. Or, or it can also be used for auditing. Or you can also do it all together. The important is that you define clear goals and you are sure why you are doing something in terms of analysis. Because you should ask questions, right, about data. You should be confident in what to ask and in what you are searching. Because otherwise, it's just an exploration, which is good. I mean, it can make sense. But I think that for SEO, in most cases, you actually already know what you want. So what's an example of a good goal to set up? I mean, if you have a, okay, if you have a B2C content website, the, the average website where you just have content, a good question to ask, actually, a good goal, or even question to ask, would be how to improve some clusters. Like, if I have some topic clusters, some, I don't know, some groups of content, how can I improve them in terms of traffic? Where do we have a margin of improvement? Not in terms of on page. I mean, in terms of adding more content, finding new angles, okay? So how can I do it? And Search Console data give you this answer because you have a lot of queries. Even if you're not ranking for it, it's still data that you need for research, okay? Another example is when you have to audit, like, you can ask, what are, what are the pages that have the highest potential, right? This can be a goal, finding the pages with the highest potential to get more money. But how do you define highest potential? This is another question, and so on. Okay, okay. But, but highest potential could, could, could be something like highest potential traffic, highest potential uh, ranking increase? Uh, well, okay, if you're a content website and you're doing display ads, 
you can merge data, I don't know, with your uh, ads provider, like Adway, Castrive, Mediavine, it depends on what you're doing on your website. If you're doing affiliate marketing, of course, traffic alone is useless. If you, are, you don't have a leaf, you're not selling anything, you have to sell something, right, on your pages. So in these cases, you can also integrate other data. Like other data, you join them, you try to understand where to look or define your own metrics. So that's number two, defining goals. That takes us up to number three, data cleaning. Okay, so before you start with, you know, analysis, you need to do data cleaning or munging, as it's called. So essentially you manipulate the data to understand <laughs> what is not useless for your analysis or what is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You, you still need to figure out what you have to remove because you do analysis. For example, if you have a content website on WordPress, usually you want to remove tag, categories, and of course, uh, hashtags, because hashtags are used for site links, and you don't need site links, because they are on, uh, you don't care about site links. It, they are useless. In, in terms of analysis, you don't want to analyze a site link, because of course, they're going to get zero clicks and inflate your impressions. So that's why you remove them. You're going to remove like page because pagination is not what you need. You just want articles. You don't need to have pagination because you're measuring how to improve your articles, your traffic. And also author pages because, I mean, they're not supposed to rank in terms of organic traffic. You don't want to rank an author. I, I, I mean, you should have them indexed. Okay, that's fine. But it's not the, the goal of our analysis. We're talking about content and how to get more money. So improving author pages is not going to help you because it's not content in terms of articles, blog posts. Understood. I mean, you, you, can, you can rank for author pages and sometimes you can get traffic if you've got a relatively famous author. Yeah, 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 but at the yeah, end yeah. of the day, that traffic's not going to convert. So that's what, not, not what you're measuring at the moment. Yeah, but it's, it's useless because you just want to find articles. Not pagination, not technical. This is not technical stuff. It's more about strategy and content. Eh? This is an important point. You are not here to track tag pages or other stuff. We are just to find the articles that matter so that you can improve them and get more traffic or whatever. If you get more data, getting more sales, whatever. So once you, you do data cleaning, you also have to clean other details like queries. Usually when you pull data via the API, even if your website is in English, you get foreign data, like query in Japanese or even in Arabic, which is quite common actually. So I also remove them, especially for, of course, if you are an, have an English website, you don't care about foreign characters like Japanese queries because your website is in English. So you remove them because they're not of interest for your analysis. And you also try to remove if you want, it depends on your goal, so point two, you try to remove all of those that are not useful. For example, if you're sure that some queries are not related to your business, okay, and you are sure they are just there because Google ranks you position, I don't know, 70 for them, you can remove them. So there is also a manual part, okay, because this is data science, it's not SEO. You have to take care about your data and remove what's not needed for your analysis. So that's data cleaning, a lot of cleaning to be done, but let's move on to number four, analysis. Okay, so during analysis, which is where the actual work happens, I usually check some, I have some processes since I also work with, I, I just work with content websites. So it, it's more narrow compared to, you know, doing e-commerce, SAS, all of them together. If you only cover one type, it's kind of easier to have processes. I usually check the query count, unique query count, which means I count how many queries, okay, a page is ranking for, unique. So no repetition, there are no duplicates, unique queries to understand the weight of a page. Of course, you have to be careful because you can also rank for queries in low position or you can also rank for useless queries. But on average, unique query count is a good indication of the potential of a page. If you're not considering affiliate marketing or other, you know, other monetary data, mm -hmm. uh, query count is the best way to measure something because usually you just want to understand where you can get more queries for B2C, okay? So you can expand your topic. Then another thing I check is the number of, zero pa of pages with zero clicks. Why? Because 
if your website has, I don't know, 40% of zero clicks pages, it's not a good website probably. Because if you're going to get organic traffic and you are telling Google, look, almost half of my website is not worth it, Google will, of course, understand it and penalize you. This is quite common. If you have a good, a bad ratio between, let's say, content get, that is getting clicks and nothing, of course, this is not a benefit. So this is something you always have to monitor, like every month for me, because it takes nothing to run. It's cheap. So are you quite aggressive with getting rid of zero-click pages or redirecting them to something else? No? No, no, no. I'm not aggressive, but I'm aggressive at finding them because you have to find them. Then you decide. Because if those pages are used by other marketing channels, like social media, newsletter, whatever, you keep them. You don't have to delete them. If they have comments, if they have backlinks, I, I will never delete them, okay? But if they're not related to your business, even if they get traffic, so it's not even about the clicks at some point. If they're not related to your business, they're just to get traffic, but get no leads, okay? Like, if you publish B2C content on a B2B website, you get traffic, but you get zero leads because you have to sell services, right? So those pages are more at risk. Or those pages get, get zero clicks and are thin content, and they can't be updated, okay? If they have no chance of recovery, they are thin pages, so they have weak content or no content at all, I prune them. But it's like the, the last resort. I don't think about pruning as the first solution. Okay, and pruning, just to confirm, means getting rid of them. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, let's uh, move on to number five, insights and implementation. Okay, so number five, uh, it's actually understanding how you can use this data. And this is the tricky part, because analysis is kind of not easy, but finding the code is easy, because it's always the same. I and mean, you can also ask ChatGPT. There is no problem. The problem is getting the insights, so using this data, this information, actually, okay? Because, for, in for instance, something I didn't say in step four is that I usually check also the percentage of traffic that uh, top 10 pages by clicks get to understand the risk of a website. Because if your website is reliant on, you know, 10 pages to get traffic, it's a risk. Because if you get even one page losing one position, you get huge losses, okay? So during insights, during the step five, this is important because you have to understand how to use what I just said to you to propose a solution. Like, okay, I know this fact, how can I use this to my advantage? Like, how can I improve the website or give an actionable solution to reduce risk? Or knowing that the query count is high for these pages, okay? How can I diversify this topic, like get more sub-articles, sub-topics, etc.? Or how can I make more money if I know that these pages have a higher profit potential because the value from ads are, tell are hinting at me that those are better? How can I do it? So once you have the information from step number four, you have to create a strategy. So this is where SEO comes into play that makes sense for what you have to do, that can bring results, okay? So this is the hardest part, the most challenging part, because first you have to clean data properly. If you don't, you can do the other steps. And then you have to understand what you just did, because doing it is not enough. So you have to be really smart about it and to understand during step two, what you want or what you have to merge together and, and so on. Wow. Okay. I'm sure that 99% of SEOs listening to this will be thinking, I can do be, I can be doing a lot more with Google Search Console yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity there. Well, let's finish off with the Pareto pickle. So Pareto says that you can get 80% of your results from 20% of your efforts. What's one SEO activity that you would recommend that provides incredible results for modest levels of effort? Clustering. Full stop. Clustering. There's, there's, there's a one-word answer for you there. So clustering content on your site. Uh, no, clustering keywords, actually. Uh, also content, of course, but clustering keywords, like in terms of grouping your keywords together. There are some tools that can... You can also do it yourself if you are, have some knowledge, but you can just pay for a tool and do it, right? Cluster keywords, and you save a lot of time for content production. Any particular tool you'd recommend? Uh, keyword insights, yeah, keyword insights. Okay, great. And um, then that obviously leads your, your, your content production strategy. 
Yeah, of course, you, have, you still have some manual work to do. I mean, of course, you just you don't just take the tool and do it, but it's a great, usually this process is a great companion because you can just pick a list of keywords, right? Find if there are some common domains on the SERPs, which is the, I mean, the best way to check if you have to create one or more articles and you get a list so you can understand what to do. So this is the best, really, this is, I think, the best SEO activity in terms of uh, trade-off, like effort, cost. I mean, it's quite expensive. Thanks for Buck. Yeah, it's quite expensive if you, if you pay a tool. I admit it's quite expensive, not for a freelancer or for a small business. But considering that you do keyword research, I hope, not every day, it's not that expensive because you do it once in a, I mean, once in a while. I don't think you do it every single day, so it's feasible. Once in a while? W once a year? Once a quarter? No, 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 no. It depends on the situation, the scope of the project. I also sometimes I do it like every week if it is a very super dynamic project, mm -hmm. but other times it's every three months. I, I, there is no magic number. I would say the scope of the project dictates the research and the budget, of course. I've been your host, David Bain. You can find Marco by searching Marco Giordano on Twitter or LinkedIn. Marco, thanks so much for being on the In Search SEO podcast. No problem. Bye. And thank you for listening. Check out all the previous episodes and sign up for a free trial of the Rank Ranger platform over at rankranger.com. Yeah.